Who am I? What am I here for? Today we have Corey Benjamin speaking as he challenges us to discover the answer to these questions in relationship to Christ, knowing that we find our identity in Him. If we know who He is, we begin to discover who we are. We hope you are challenged and encouraged by today's message. Thank you guys for the opportunity. I love getting up here and speaking for several reasons. Uh, number one, the time that I get to spend in the Word is unlike any other time for me, because I do not want to get up here and look like an idiot. And uh, I'm being vulnerable with you guys at the same time by telling you that I need to spend more time in the Word, so much like Taylor described this morning, that it is just flowing out of me, right? And I really love the, uh, I love how you communicated that this morning. So thank you guys. Thank you guys for challenging me and, and giving me these opportunities, and, and I love the opportunity to speak. Um, so let's get started here. Four weeks ago, Gabrielle Freeman spoke about making up your mind, and, and it was an incredible message. Would you all agree with me there? Yeah, it was incredible. Yeah, let's give her, let's give her a round of applause. Whether, whether it was the, the content, the topic, the delivery, I kind of felt like I was at a TED Talk segment watching this you know, Fortune 500 CEO up here deliver a great message. And, and it was so encouraging to me to see that, Gabrielle, you about 19? Yeah. yeah, 19 years old. We have a bright future, church, a very, very bright future. But when I began to reflect on her message, I, I, was, I really was drawn to one particular part of it. And I wanted to use that as a springboard here this morning. 30,000 thoughts on average per day. That's an insane number, isn't it? I will say, though, that I believe that my wife would have that per minute. And, um, and she would agree with me, too. And I do want to listen to every single one of those thoughts, 100%, and give you an answer on those. But no, in, in all seriousness, 30,000 thoughts a day, that equates to about 11 million per year and over a billion thoughts over your lifetime. And if I sit back and I imagine what does that actually sound like, it might sound like something like this. Does anybody understand what's going on here? These are maybe, if I was to dive into my brain at any given moment and start thinking about this, there's so much going on right now that you can't focus on me or you focus on that, and it gets overwhelming, doesn't it? So this morning, what we're going to focus on as these people stop talking. Yes, look at that, that was slick. We're gonna focus on the two questions that I feel are huge for young people, for middle-aged people, and for older people. And they are, who am I, and why am I here? Does anybody else ever think about these things? And you can be honest, there's no judgment. I'll put my hand up first. My man Jay Friesen over there has got me. Anybody else? Yeah, that's, that's more like it. <laughs> that's good, that's good, that's good. Well, I, I think about that a lot. And I understand who I am in Christ, but I often think, you know, who am I and why am I here? And so when you sit back and you think about that, you start to wonder, am I what I do? So for example, am I a a basketball player? Do I play hockey? Am I a musician? Am I a business leader? Am I a pastor? Am I an accountant? Obviously, I'm not an accountant. I'm not a pastor, but I'm just kind of giving you a generic overview of, of some thoughts that might be going through our heads. Am I a doctor? Am I a nurse? Am I a construction worker? No, no, no. I'm, I'm a mother. That's what I am. No, I'm a father. No, I'm a husband. No, I'm a wife. I'm a mother. I'm a son. I'm a daughter. No, 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 wait, simply, no, that can't be it. It's got to be what I've achieved. I'm a university grad. Yeah, that's great. I actually didn't even graduate high school. I'm an MVP. I successfully started a startup company. I stuck to my diet for one week. Yeah. I finally saved the princess in Super Mario. That is an achievement. For anybody that does not know who Super Mario is, I'm sorry. But this one's from my daughter over here or taking a dub for Fortnite. No, 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 hang on a second. I'm defined by the things that I've done right. I married an incredible woman. I have two amazing children. Or am I defined by the things that I've done wrong? As a youth, 
I was expelled from school at the age of 13. I was stealing cars. I was stealing stereos. I was doing all kinds of crazy things. My parents were not happy with me for that season of life. There's no doubt about it. But I was a troubled kid. But no, 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 wait. Let's, let's stop there for a second. I know what it is. It's who I am on social media. You know that selfie that you take and then you edit your photos so that you look flawless? I always look at pictures online, so don't, don't unfriend me because I'm saying this, but I'm always looking at the shadowing in the background, and there's that contour to the face, and you're like, okay, they took an airbrush to that, and uh, they fixed their eyes. And... But worse off, it's about the people that actually like my picture. So I find my value and my identity and how many likes I got. I threw a picture up a couple weeks ago about all it said was, LeBron James, and I got two likes, and I was like, I failed at life. Nobody on social media liked my post. Nobody except for two people. And I mean, if you don't know what LeBron James did about a week ago, you don't know basketball. That's very simple. That's probably why nobody responded. <laughs> what was that? <laughs> or you're a Warriors fan. I was actually referring to the Boston game, where he picked the whole entire team and carried them into the finals. But... Wait, 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 wait. One more thought, one more thought. It's, I get it, it's what others think about me. That is who I am, right? Mr. Harder, what do you think of me? Good man. Okay, well, that's good. I was hoping for some derogatory remark. (laughs) Jocelyn, give me one. A leader. Okay, these are cool things. But I can't find my value in, in, in what others think of me, right? You see, how I identify myself is how I will approach life. Very simple. For example, if I am what I do, I will always need to do more and achieve more to find my value. Let me say that again. Has anybody ever called me and had me say, yeah, it's, how's it going? I was like, yeah, it's, it's busy. Has anybody ever heard me say anything other than I'm busy? Honestly. It is busy. I'm always busy. And I sometimes I look at that and I'm like, If I am what I do, then I'll always need to do more and achieve more to find my value, right? So I'm constantly doing things. And I'm not necessarily doing the wrong things. I'm working. I'm taking my girls to to basketball or to friends' houses, hanging out with my wife. I'm doing things, but I I seem to busy myself. And that's where I, I relate to the who am I portion of this message. On the flip side, if I'm what others say I am, then I'll always do things to please people. And you know, that just doesn't work, does it? How many people know somebody who just, they are a complete, total people pleaser? Nobody, hey? Hmm. Wow. So he said, well, I'll speak up for you guys. I know a couple. And they get themselves in trouble every time. I have a specific guy that I know. He takes care of uh, some clients and he does whatever they ask him to, and he looks just like this carpet. They come in, they walk all over him, they wipe their feet on him, and it's brutal, and, and he doesn't stand up for himself. And we've been talking about this a lot over the last year, but society in the world would suggest, and have you believe, that as you travel down the road of self-discovery so that you can find yourself within yourself, this is the world's approach to finding yourself. Now, this is, this is really interesting. I spent, spent quite a bit of time reading this because I was, I, was, I was actually blown away by how much nonsense there is out there, to be honest with you. But um, this train of thought of self-discovery from a, from a society-type view, from a world-type view, is so, so selfish I, I, in a lot of ways. It's, it would almost suggest that you were the center of the universe and the world revolved around you. Let me... Let me read you a few of these questions as I embarked on my journey to self-discovery. People will tell you many things along the way to self-discovery, but ultimately the key is you. Number two, you need to experience and actually do things in life to know if they feel right. Now, if you don't know a bit of my backstory, I'm going to dive into this, and honey, I'm, I'm sorry right away, but... My parents split up at a young age, and my biological father comes from a Jewish background, and my mom uh, is more from a European background. So my mom got saved when I was about 12, and I got saved when I was about 14, but I was living with my father up until I was 14. So my biological father asks me when I ask my beautiful wife to marry me, have you 
had sex with, the, with your, your girlfriend yet? And I was like, well, no, I haven't. And his response was, well, you need to experience this to know if it's right. And I was like, no, man, I, I, I don't. I wanted to be able to stand in front of my daughters and talk to them about the value of remaining pure. And that meant something to me, right? And it should still mean something today. The night before needs to be different than the night after. The people, number three, the people that don't understand you the most likely weren't meant to stay on your path. Well, isn't that amazing? I don't agree with you, so I'm never going to talk to you again. If that was the case, there are many relationships that I have, even in this room, where we have butt heads. But there's an old saying that iron sharpens iron, right? Don't you want people in your life that are going to be there for you when maybe you've taken a left when you should have taken a right? That are going to go through situations with you? I, I'm just blown away by the, I hate to say it, the, the stupidity of some of this. Your path will be led by strange impulses and callings that your mind will fail to understand. You'll become someone else. But that's for your own good. Wow. Wow. Let me tell you something. You will know who you are and what you are here to do when you know who Jesus is and what he was here to do. Very simple. Very simple. So if you can't know yourself until you know your maker, then you must know Jesus. Isn't that amazing when you think about that? You will not know who you are and what you're here to do until you know who Jesus is and what he was here to do. So let's talk about who Jesus is. Straight out. Jesus is the Son of God. He was the perfect image of our Creator. He was a visible image of the invisible one. There's so much to think about from that previous statement. First off, if God has a Son, then that would mean God has a family. And the Son became like us, then that would mean that God wants us to join Him, wouldn't it? He fashioned His Son after us so that we might be able to see that. So the very first thing that we learn is that by looking to Christ, we realize that we are desired by the creator of life. Let's take a second look at this. And I'm going to jump right into my first scripture here. 1 John 3.1 says, See how very much our Father loves us, for he calls us his children. And that is what we are. I'm going to run through about 10 or 12 scriptures here in how God communicates to us how much he loves us. And as we related to, we have to, uh, as we related to earlier, we have to understand who he is and how much he cares for us to understand who we are and why we are here. Let's keep moving here. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, this means anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone and a new life has begun. Isn't that an amazing promise? That old life, that that guy that got kicked out of school and had to steal and do bad things, that's gone. It's dead. It's over. And you know what? Anytime that enemy tries to remind me of my past, I simply just remind him of his future. It's very simple. (laughs) Ephesians 1.4 says, Even before he made the world, God loved us and chose us in Christ to be holy and without fault in his eyes. And as a dad, I understand that statement right there. Because when I look at my beautiful girls, I don't see the fault in them. I don't see the mistakes that they make. I see them. Right? Ephesians 2.10 says, for we are God's masterpiece. Like when you think of famous painters like Picasso, who would paint something and he would call it his masterpiece and there would be this ridiculous value put on this thing. This is God saying that we, every single one of you guys and everybody outside these walls is his masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus so we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. Does this make sense, people? Awesome. 1 Thessalonians 1.4 says... We know, dear brothers and sisters, that God loves you and has chosen you to be his people. He's chosen us. He's made a decision. He made his son in our image, sent him down to show us the way, and then left to go prepare a place for us to come back to. That's like, what an amazing promise. 
You can shout me down if you want. It's okay. You don't have to be quiet. <laughs> Colossians 2.10 says, So you are also, you also are complete through your union with Christ, who is the head over every ruler and authority. Every ruler, every religion, every religious leader, every leader in our country, God is over top of all of them. Don't ever wonder that. 2 Corinthians 6, 18 says, And I will be your father, and you will be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. I'm just rattling these off because I was just so overwhelmed by how much God loves me. I really was. So I have no identity crisis up here. None. After when I start hearing that God has formed himself after me, that he, I am his masterpiece, wow. And regardless of the dad that I had as a kid, it says right here, I will be your father. Oh man, I don't know about y'all, but that's, that's pretty exciting for me. Galatians 3.26 says, for you are all children of God through faith in Jesus. And probably one of the most known scriptures in the entire Bible is, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son, Jesus, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but shall have eternal life. I am blown away by that. I can't say it enough, church. You are loved by God. And you are wanted by God. He spared no effort He lavishes his love on us, lavish meaning generously, extravagantly, so much that he sacrificed his life for me, for you, for all of us. And once we begin to figure out who we are in Christ, our reason for existence becomes known. So now that we kind of understand a little bit about who we are in Christ, let's talk about why we are here. And this might not be a surprise to some, and it might be a surprise to others. To simply put it, Jesus came here to save the lost, to seek and save the lost by making himself known. That kind of summarizes everything, doesn't it? So what is my purpose and what am I doing here? Well, we are here to continue that mission that Jesus came here to start, to save you, to save me. We are to be his hands, his feet. We are to show the love of God, not talk about the love of God. It's really easy to get up in front of everybody here this morning and convey God's love to you and then walk, off the do- walk out the front door and get cut off in traffic and flip somebody the bird and throw on some, I don't know, some raunchy music and, and just have a good time, right? No, 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 no. We, we, we have to live this, church. It's got to be part of us. It's got to pour out of us. Everything that we do needs to point back to our Savior. In keeping with good time here this morning, we've, we've kind of rifled right through here. I'm going to get you guys out of here by noon. Your pot roast will not be burnt. It's teasing you. <laughs> I love picking on you. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'll get, it, I'll get it back later. I want to close with the following story. Mark 8, 27 through 29. Jesus has fed the 4,000, and um, they're making their way back to, to town here. And I'll just read it to you. It says, Jesus and his disciples left Galilee and went up to the village near, I don't know, I think there's an S missing, but it should be like Caesarea, Philippi. Are we cool with that? Perfect. Near there. As they were walking along, he asked them, who do people say I am? Can you imagine being a disciple and having Jesus ask you that? Who do people say that I am? Well, they replied, some say John the Baptist. Some say Elijah. And others say you are one of the prophets. This question here, I I don't know, I may have slowly walked to the back of the 12 to answer. When Jesus turned and says to them, but who do you say that I am? Peter replied simply, well, you are the Messiah. So my my question for you this morning is, who do you say that I am? And I'm not talking about me, Corey Benjamin. But think about walking beside Jesus in that moment in your flip-flops or your slides 
and, and God's talking to you and he looks at you and says, who do you say that I am? And you start to think about that and you start to let that just kind of settle into your spirit. And you say, well, my life says that, who you are. And then my attitude says who you are. My words say who I am. My actions say who I am. My reactions say who I am. The way I treat people say that I, who I am. The way that I love people say who I am. So my question for you today as we close up is simply, it's the wrong slide, but who do you say that I am? And I'm going to leave that with you. And I hope you guys have an amazing week. Thank you. Thank you for taking time to listen to today's message. If you are encouraged or challenged by what you heard today, please let us know. We'd love to hear from you. Send us your story to mystory@jubileecalgary.com. You can also invest in the lives of others by partnering with us financially. Your gift can impact many as God works through your generosity to help us continue sharing this message with others. Donations can be given online at jubileecalgary.com backslash give. Your feedback and giving are truly appreciated.